Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see you here. Uh, welcome to NYU Abu Dhabi. My name is Justin Stearns. I'm uh, head of the Arab Crossroads program here, uh, which is particularly fortuitous for me this evening because um, this talk is just, is just perfect for us. We're very, very uh, fortunate to have Fahad Bishara with us. He is Associate Professor of History in Arabian Peninsula and Gulf Studies at the University of Virginia. He um, wrote a book, A Sea of Debt, Law and Economic Life in the Western Indian Ocean, 1780 to 1950. And this book is, I think we can see it here as a, um, a prequel to the project that we're going to hear about this evening. It explored the intertwined legal and economic history of the Indian Ocean world through the history of Omani, an Indian settlement and commercialization of East Africa. And he has written numerous, numerous, numerous articles and book chapters on different dimensions of the history of law and capitalism in the Indian Ocean. And what we're going to hear about tonight is his work on a new project of the oceanic history of the Gulf told through the voyages of a single Tao. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't note that his, his work, his previous work, is CF Debt, has won several awards, the J. Willard Hurst Prize, which is awarded by the Law and Society Association, and the Jerry Bentley Prize, which is awarded by the World History Association, and the Peter Gonfelstein Book Award, given by the American Society of, of, of Legal History. And um, his scholarship has already made a real big impression on those of us who are interested in reading around the Indian Ocean and around the Gulf, and it's just wonderful to have him here with us this evening. So please join me in welcoming Fahed Bishar. All right. Is this thing on? It is. Okay, great. Thank you, Justin. I, I really appreciate that introduction. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm, I'm really, really very happy to be here to share my work uh, with this community. I'm especially happy to share this work with this community. Uh, I'm from Kuwait. Uh, I've always admired everything that you all do over here, uh, and I've, I've looked forward to this chance to, to share work with you for some time. So thank you, Justin and Nahid. I don't know where Nahid is. She's somewhere around here. There she is in the back. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. So this is the story of uh, a voyage, or at least it's supposed to be a story of a voyage. I'm going to begin, though, uh, by telling you about a single object, uh, a notebook. The notebook belonged to a Dao captain, Nukhid uh, Abdul Majid Al Mullah Ahmed Al Fainichawi. Uh, as the family name suggests, he lived uh, on Felika Island off the coast of Kuwait. Although the Nukhida himself tells us in a colophon to his uh, notebook that his family came to Felicha from, uh, well, when he, was, when he was very young, from Kharij Island off the coast of what's today Iran. None of you will know the Nukhida Abdul Majid al Felichawi. And you shouldn't. Uh, in fact, most of us, I would say, probably don't know very many Nukhida at all. Um, and even those of us who know Nukhida, We'll know that in the sort of the pantheon of famous Nawakhida in Gulf history, uh, Al Felichawi was not the most famous. He's a hardly known figure at all. Uh, he didn't undertake any extraordinary voyages. He was just like everybody else. Uh, over the course of his 25 year sailing career, from roughly 1920 to 1945, he traveled the same routes that almost all the other uh, Nawakhida in Kuwait did. Uh, nor did Al Felichawi write any treatises like any of the other Nawakhida. Uh, we're going to meet a couple of them. All we have is this notebook. Uh, actually, there are three notebooks. The notebook is a very ordinary notebook, but in some ways a very extraordinary notebook. Inside the notebook are all sorts of different things that the Nawakhida noted down. And I promise you I'm going to give you translations of some of these things uh, along the course of the talk. But he included in his notebook copies of contracts, notes on navigation, diagrams, and much more, lots of different observations. And like I said, there are three different notebooks, all of which contained also logs of his actual voyages, which is what you see over here uh, on the right. That's the log of the voyage itself. These were principally, we might think of them as log books, which the Nawakhida called the Roznama. Now, Roznama, which is, of course, a Persian term. It's worth reading these notebooks and thinking about them more closely since they raise important questions for us. Uh, I should say, though, that the Ruznama, the logbook, is an unlikely candidate for raising questions about anything. 
uh, as a source for writing history, it's about as dry as they come, which is kind of ironic given that it's a source about the sea. But we imagine, when we think of logbooks, we imagine them containing all sorts of really rich information about the voyage and all of the things that, the, that happened on board the Dow and all the things that people saw. Uh, but nothing could be further from the truth, actually. The bulk of the Ruznama uh, entries consist of brief, dull observations on wind, water, and general location. Uh, as a genre of writing, and one produced during the act of travel, the Ruznama is actually astonishingly boring. There are lots of interesting notes throughout it, though, and I'll get to those. There is stuff to think through. But there was more than just the logbook. The Nochida kept a whole chest of his belongings. Inside the chest, it's a Malabar teak chest, which is going to be significant. Actually, it's not that significant. It's just a Malabar teak chest. Um, there are, inside this chest, there are lots of different materials. There are the maps, and you see rolled up maps at the, the uppermost layer. There were accounts. There were navigational instruments and lots and lots of books. Some of these clearly made their way into the collection after the Nochida had stopped sailing. Uh, but most of them were right from those days, materials that made their way around the Western Indian Ocean and back. And we know that because uh, El Felichawi was actually very good at annotating all of his material, making a note of when different objects, different books, different notebooks entered into his possession. It was really, really exciting, the moment in which I encountered this collection with the family, and I'd be happy to talk about how I, how I met them. But uh, as excited as I was, um, it was a, a little difficult to wrap my mind around the materials that Fede Chawi had left behind. The logbooks, the maps, the scattered accounts, the books. How do you place these materials historically? Read as part of a national history, uh, a history of Kuwait, the collection is actually really difficult to make sense of. Uh, none of. None of it, virtually none of it, has anything to do with Kuwait proper. It sails out beyond the horizon of the nation. Read from the standpoint of our standard categories of world history, the Middle East, um, these sources seem a little bit adrift. They move between parts of the world that at least ostensibly, at least apparently, have nothing to do with the Middle East itself. And they spend a lot of time in between, in the spaces in between these different geographical containers. The challenge for the historian then is to figure out how to place material like this, uh, and more importantly, how to write about the spaces and worlds these materials and the actors who produced them inhabited. Materials like these highlight the tension between narratives of the Gulf that have been conceived of as principally terrestrial, that is land-based, and a history that plays out in an oceanic arena. We might pose the question in this way. Where do we locate the history of the Gulf? The most immediate answer would be, of course, the Middle East. Except the pre-oil Gulf doesn't have a lot to do with places like Baghdad, Beirut, and Cairo. Of course, there was some connection to those places, but I'd argue that it was quite minimal. Uh, and for decades, as historians of the Gulf have grappled with this, uh, the Gulf had been relegated to the sidelines of a narrative of Middle Eastern history that principally played out in other places, places like Baghdad, Beirut, and Cairo, in the Ottoman Empire and in post-Ottoman societies. Seen from that perspective, the Gulf just doesn't appear that important. It's really peripheral to the narrative of the pre-modern and modern Middle East until the rise of oil. And I challenge any one of you to go find a textbook on Middle Eastern history and look for the Gulf. When does the Gulf appear in any narrative of Middle Eastern history? It doesn't appear until after the rise of oil. The, Arabian, the entire Arabian Peninsula, arguably, is, is absent from the grand narratives of Middle Eastern history. But what if we imagine the Gulf as something else? What if we imagine Gulf history to principally connect to places elsewhere? Places like Bombay, Karachi, Calicut, Zanzibar, Aden. What new histories does that bring to light? What new processes does it suggest? What new questions and materials might it bring to light? For years now, I've been arguing that we ought to think of the history of the Gulf as part of the Indian Ocean. And what does that mean? 
at the simplest level, the suggestion is to think about oceans as spaces that connect places together, connect societies together, rather than separating them. As a premise, uh, Indian Ocean history asks us to think about how we divide up the world around us. Is it by terrestrial continents? Do we think in terms of the Middle East, Africa, Asia? Or can we think of the spaces that connect those land masses together? Once we do that, then, we can begin to think of the communities, goods, ideas, political formations, and all of the historical processes that have been left out, occluded from our land-based views. If we read the history of the Gulf from the sea rather than the land, we can reposition the region. An oceanic approach to the Gulf opens up new periodizations, fruitful avenues of historical inquiry, and new readings of old sources that allow us to think about questions of circulation, connection, and entanglement. But more than that, an oceanic history of the Gulf allows historians to push against the discourses of nativism that have pervaded the public sphere in the Gulf. It suggests a history of the Gulf in which the past is scattered along a vast littoral and woven into a much broader transregional fabric. I won't get into all of this today, but I'll hopefully show enough of it to you that you might be convinced. I don't want us to think about this in the abstract either. After all, we have a real ship, a real person, a real world out there. Over the course of the next 45 minutes, probably a little bit more, over the course of the next hour, I'll open up the Malabar chest and we'll think about the world of connection and circulation that it allows us to see. But first, the Tao itself. It was September of 1924. The Nokhida Abdul Majid al Fail inspected his Tao before the sailing season. The ship was called Al Awai, or Al Awaj, the Crooked. An unusual name for a Tao, though it was only a nickname. We actually don't know the real name of the Tao. It's long gone, lost in a record somewhere. But given what others named their Tao's, we can guess that it was probably Feth al Khair, Feth al Bari, Feth al Karim, some other Feth, right? But everybody knew, everybody knew this Tao as Al Awai, the crooked. It got the name because it started off as a smaller coasting ship, but the shipwright extended its hull with additional planks, making it look a little bit off kilter. It wasn't off kilter though. Felchao would, would sail the crooked for nearly 15 years before moving on to another Dao. By 1924, when the sailing season begins, the sailing season we're thinking of begins, he was ready to go on his fourth voyage as the Dao's no Khidr. And when Felchao and his crew set out that year, they sailed a route that was very similar to what many other Dao's were doing that year, one that many had done for decades before. The crooked. The crooked sailed out from Kuwait to Basra, where the crew loaded its principal cargo, the dates of southern Iraq, which is the most productive date-growing region in the world. And Felichawi and his crew loaded these onto their dows, and they would transport them to markets around the western Indian Ocean. From Basra, so up here, the dow sailed down the coast of Persia, and then into India, into Karachi, and then to Gujarat over here, and then Bombay, and then down the Konkan and Malabar coasts, making it to Calicut. From there, it crossed the open sea. So I'm here, this is a general schema of all of the different routes that Nokhidas did. From here, it crossed the open sea up to Masqat, and then ambled back up the coast, stopping in Bahrain for several weeks before uh, returning to Kuwait in late May at the end of the sailing season, just in time for the pearling season. This is an itinerary hundreds of other Nawakha that followed year after year, at least the ones that went to India. There was a separate itinerary that took people down to the east coast of Africa, although sometimes, as evidenced by this green line, sometimes they did cross directly from uh, India to East Africa. They did this from year to year, from at least the mid 19th century forward. At least this is the, what I can, I can attest to with the documentation. And as they sailed from one port to another, Dows like the Crooked 
moved through a trans-regional commercial society, a community of Gulf traders and agents and their business associates from all over. It's hard to know, hard to know where to even begin to tell the histories of Gulf traders in the Indian Ocean. I won't try to cover all of that. Uh, evidence of a maritime trade between the Gulf and India goes back thousands of years. Even in its more modern guises, more recent guises, there's medieval trade with the Indian Ocean, the expansion of Omani trade with India and East Africa in the 1600s, and a whole, whole lot more. For the Northern Gulf, though, for the Northern Gulf, for the community that Dufele Chawi came from, that modern history is a little bit more recent. Uh, we might date the rise of Northern Gulf traders to the mid-1700s, after the Utubi Sheikhdoms established themselves in what's today Kuwait and Bahrain. By the early 19th century, uh, we have evidence of inhabitants of Kuwait accumulating land holdings in Basra, which formed much of their resource base. They would, they would buy up date farms in Basra, which they would then sell in India. Uh, they'd sell the, the, they produce the dates, they'd sell, sell around the Western Indian Ocean alongside the pearls that they fished. It's not clear exactly when they break into the Indian Ocean trade. Some have suggested that it was after the fall of the Omani Empire in the mid-19th century. The story goes that the Omanis were in some ways the guardians of the Gulf, the sentinels of the Gulf, uh, and they wouldn't let local Daos pass through the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, they would instead force them to buy goods at Muscat and then send them back. Uh, the problem, of course, is that it just isn't true, right? Already by the 1820s, we have lots of reports about what people in the northern Gulf are doing. One English officer writes that the Kuwaiti Dows navigate the Gulf of Persia, Red Sea, the coasts of Sindh, Gujarat, and Malabar, and to Bombay. And they imported a variety of goods from those places. Another English traveler in 1831 described sailing from Bombay to Kuwait uh, in a Kuwaiti Dow, a Kuwaiti Ghala. He said, manned by 40 or 50 natives of Grain, or Kuwait, on the western side of the Persian Gulf, and commanded by a handsome Nohida in the prime of manhood. What we do know, for sure, is that by the second half of the 19th century, inhabitants of the northern Gulf are setting up business offices in India in greater numbers. Merchants from Basra, of course, have been doing this from the 18th century in places like Surat. As more and more Gulf traders accumulate land holdings along the Shatl Arab waterway around Basra, and many people are doing this. I should say it's not just Kuwaitis. Bahrainis are buying up this land. Other people uh, from the Persian coast, are the, Basra is like the place that you want to own land if you have money. Right? And the, as they're doing this, uh, they also sought out trading partners in India and then eventually ended up sending their own agents and their own associates over there. By the late 19th century, Gulf traders established offices up and down the west coast of India, but cluster around a few main nodes. Uh, Karachi and Bombay, mostly, and later Calicut. These are all places that al would call at during his voyage in 1924. From there, these Gulf merchants would establish relationships with local associates and brokers in Gujarat, in Goa, Mangalore, Kochi, and they'd weave them all together into a trans-regional commercial society. These were all business partners. These were all relatives, actually. They married into one another's families. They wrote to one another, and we'll talk about what they wrote to one another. They circulated goods to one another, credit, information. And as they moved around this transoceanic marketplace and connected different port cities to one another, Gulf merchants situated themselves in the interstices of a world of overlapping jurisdictions. Through their connections to Basra, many of them were able to position themselves as Ottoman subjects. In the late 1880s, the consul, the Ottoman consul at Bombay, compiled a list of Ottoman flagged vessels at that port. Many had come to, Kuwait, to Bombay from Kuwait by way of Basra. And you see the names over here. It's hard to read, but you see this Kuwaitli, 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 right? These are the, the, uh, the, Kuwaiti, the Kuwaiti vessels the Kuwaiti vessels that, had, that were carrying the Ottoman flag, Ottoman flagged Kuwaiti vessels that were arriving in, in Bombay. Of course, this is at a time that many would have rightly assumed Kuwait to be an Ottoman port anyway. Uh, the port's ruling family, Kuwait, Kuwait's ruling family, accepted appointments as Ottoman office holders and agreed to uphold Istanbul's right to sovereignty and suzerainty in their district. Kuwait merchants also owned extensive date farms in Basra 
and could very easily claim Ottoman subjecthood. It's unsurprising then that Kuwaitis would end up flying the Ottoman flag on their vessels. But in addition to the Ottoman Empire, Kuwaiti traders wove themselves into the fabric of a number of different polities around the Indian Ocean. Some, like the Ottomans, are what we might think of as global empires. There were the Ottomans, there were the French, and ultimately the British as well, and I'll get to the British in a moment. Uh, others were what we might think of as regional empires, namely the Omani Empire, which spanned broad swaths of South Arabia and East Africa uh, in the late 18th and 19th centuries. And then there were much smaller polities, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, all of which entertained different relationships with regional and global polities as well. As they sailed their ships and shuttled their cargoes around the, the Indian Ocean, Gulf traders positioned themselves at the interstices of these different political formations. For these Nawakhida and traders, empire manifested itself in very particular ways. Customs houses, quarantine stations, and other points of inspection that punctuated the voyage. But also, empire manifested itself in very small things, too. The signed pieces of paper that Nawakhidas could fold up and place in a chest on their dows as part of the documentary repertoire that they wielded as they ambled along the coasts. Safe conduct passes like these, safe conduct passes that ask the person inspecting it to, to treat the holder with dignity and respect as is befitting of the, most, of, the, of the great favored nations, as they would say. They understood empire in the abstract as an entity that they could interact with in different ways over the course of centuries. But they also knew it in their very particular formations as one kind of polity among many, and a kind of polity, a kind of uh, government that they could draw into their own world on their own terms. By the end of the 19th century, though, it became clear that there was one empire that sat atop the taxonomy of empires, uh, at least for these traders, the British Raj. By that time, virtually all of the sheikhdoms of the Gulf had entered into the treaty relationships with the government of India, we know the story of the establishment of British protectorates in the Gulf. By now, there's no need to rehash it. But we know far less about the implications for Gulf traders in the Indian Ocean. But the two are intertwined, of course. As different Gulf rulers signed over their defense and foreign relations to the British Raj, Gulf traders fanned out into British-held ports around the Indian Ocean. Again, they clustered around a few main ports, Karachi and Bombay, both of which form part of the Bombay Presidency, and later Calicut. They also made their way to Aden, which of course also formed part of the Bombay Presidency, as in Aden was part of the Bombay Presidency. Uh, interestingly, very few of the northern Gulf traders uh, end up on the Swahili coast. That trade was dominated by merchants from Oman and Gujarat. And Nohidas from Kuwait visited places like Mombasa and Zanzibar with lots of frequency. Uh, Gulf traders in Aden did business with the Horn of Africa from Aden. Um, but for different reasons, they chose not to establish business offices on the east coast of Africa. They focused their energies instead on the possessions of the British Raj in the Western Indian Ocean. Part of that must have been because of the access to British political offices in Indian ports. By establishing themselves in places like Karachi, Bombay, Aden, they could tap into the legal and diplomatic infrastructure that would facilitate the movement of money and obligations around the Gulf and India. And they did this with surprising facility. Maybe not surprising facility, with facility. The process also might have been motivated by desire to take advantage of the technologies of empire and colonial capitalism in the region. From these nodes, Gulf merchants could access a growing infrastructure of communications, finance, and transportation, and they did. They made regular use of technologies like the telegraph, which they used to communicate prices and orders to one another. They made extensive use of steamships, too, to send cargoes of goods to one another. And with the emergence of banks in British India, and later in the Gulf, these merchants would use the banking infrastructure to move money between different accounts in different port cities. Eastern Bank, for example, which had a branch in Bombay, had established a branch in Basra in 1915, just a decade before Felichawi would set sail. Rather than think of the world of colonial capitalism and Indian Ocean trade as being somehow separate from one another, 
I want to suggest that the two are actually bound up in one another, which is maybe a bit of a facile point to make. But instead of talking about this in the abstract, I want us to ground it a little bit. So, about three weeks of sailing out of Basra, the crooked uh, Felichawi and his crew arrive in Karachi. This actually took a very long time. Normally, it only takes two weeks, two weeks from Basra to Karachi. Uh, for about 10 days, the crew unloaded their cargoes of dates in Karachi and in ports around Gujarat, uh, in Porbandar, which they called Khormiyan, don't ask me when, uh, and Verabel. I'm still trying to unlock this Khormiyan, this Khormiyan business. Uh, two days after leaving Verabel, so at this point roughly four and a half weeks after leaving Basra, they arrive in Bombay. Belichawi and his crew spend an unusually long time in Bombay the entire month of November, and then some. Only five of those, five days of that month were spent unloading the cargoes of dates that he had carried from Basra. And we know that because he actually writes down in his logbook. It's one of the few moments in which he actually tells us what he's doing. And he said, and we unloaded. That's all he'll ever say. We unloaded. We loaded and we unloaded. Uh, so five days spent unloading cargoes of dates that he'd carried, some of which he'd actually already sold in Karachi and in Gujarat. He also lost a few days at a shipyard. The crooked had suffered some damage along the way. Unclear what had happened, but it needed repairs. But for the most part, he spent his time in Bombay arranging for cargoes to pick up for the onward journey, which he would take him to Calicut and Goa before heading back up to the Gulf. In the weeks he spent uh, in Bombay, Felichawi would come to know the Gulf merchant community there very well. Uh, there were many to get to know. Bombay was widely known as the principal market for pearls. Where did I? Yes, over here. Bombay was known as the principal market for Gulf pearls. And Gulf pearl merchants in Bombay sometimes amassed fabulous, fabulous wealth. The merchant Jassim Ibrahim, for example, was widely known to be one of the pearl kings of Bombay. His family, the Ibrahim family, owned thousands of acres of date plantations in Basra as well. And one of his cousins, Yusuf Ibrahim, and wielded enormous political power in Kuwait and in southern Iraq as well. Jassim himself did quite well. He bought a beautiful home in a posh neighborhood, posh suburb of Bombay, built by the Parsi architect, J.P. Mystery. Of course, he was but one of many Gulf merchants in Bombay who made their money off the pearl trade. There were dozens, dozens of others like him, some of whom are pictured here in that that photograph, that very faded photograph on the top right. And there were many of them whose business had very little to do with pearls, actually, as business activities were concerned with other sectors. The al Bassam family of Aneza, for example, uh, were known for their involvement in the textile trade and established offices in Bombay. Bombay was home to a community of Arab traders from around the Gulf and Arabian Peninsula who were active in lots of different sectors and who embedded themselves in Bombay commercial society. Bombay wasn't a commercial outpost for them. For many, Bombay was home, actually. They built lives there. They built communities there. They built a school for themselves there. Their children go up there. They married women there. They died there. They left families behind there, some of whom actually remain there to this day. If you go to Bombay today, you will see traces of this Gulf past. And we have Johann Matthew over here who's written a terrific chapter on this. Bombay was also a center for Arab printing. Beginning in the late 19th century, Gulf Arabs and others regularly printed books in Bombay. They printed manuals on the pearl trade and navigation, treatises on religious thought and on other topics. They also consumed and financed Arab printing elsewhere. The story of the Arab intellectual renaissance, the Nahda, uh, in the 19th and 20th century is one that's often rooted in the histories of thinkers, editors, and journalists in the Eastern Mediterranean. And that's true. The Arab merchants of Bombay were active consumers of these publications produced in Egypt and the Levant. They subscribed to different newspapers and journals and would, would circulate them, would forward them to readers in the Gulf from there. They helped expand a growing Arab public sphere. But they also helped finance many of these presses, actually. The Gulf merchants frequently sent money to the journalist Abdel Masih Antaki, the, the editor of the journal Al Amran, and Jassim Al Ibrahim and others regularly hosted visits from Arab intellectuals, including Rashid Rada, 
whose writings they financed and who wrote glowing recollections in El Menor of his time with the Gulf merchants in Bombay. The profits that they generated from their trade in Bombay went in part to finance the emergence of a transregional public sphere, one that connected the Indian Ocean world to the Mediterranean, but also financed publications within the Indian Ocean itself. They also inserted themselves into the fabric of industrial capitalism in Bombay through other means, through steamship companies. Gulf merchants in Bombay established at least two different steamship companies in the early 20th century. One we know a fair amount about, Arab steamers. Um, and the other, or Arab steamers I should say, is a, is a, it, it's a company formed by a group of Gulf merchants uh, between Bombay, Bahrain, Kuwait, and I believe Aden as well. Um, and then there was the Persian Gulf Steam Navigation Company, which we know far less about, actually. What we do know is that in both companies, what they would do is they'd purchase discharged steamships, usually passenger lines from European companies, uh, and then refit them as cargo ships. They'd also rename them the SS Kuwait, the SS Jeddah, the SS Bedri, which is a popular name for a Dow, by the way. Um, they ultimately get pushed out of the steamship market, but that's not really the point. The point is that they thought it was possible, right? They thought it was possible and they made use of all of the institutional forms available in Bombay to do it. The history of the Gulf merchant community in Bombay is a little unusual in some respects, especially in the, the sort of intensity of their business activities. But in other ways, it's, it's thoroughly typical of Gulf merchants in the Indian Ocean. We can tell similar stories, maybe not quite so rich, on Gulf traders in Aden, Karachi, Calicut, Port Bandar, elsewhere in the Indian Ocean. These weren't separate communities either. From their business offices, these traders wrote letters to one another. At this point, we have tens of thousands of these letters, tens of thousands of letters spanning the late 19th to the mid 20th centuries. They are between merchants and their associates, Nawakhiza to merchants, and from to and from statesmen around the Western Indian Ocean. In my book, I should say this is the topic, this topic is a book, there's a book that I'm writing about all of this. Uh, in my book, I draw principally on three collections. Uh, the business archive of Mohammed bin Abdullah al Matruk, uh, a Shi'i merchant based in Basra, uh, letters addressed to Abdurrahman bin Hussein al Asusi uh, in Kuwait from members of his own family who are traveling up and down the coast of India, but also uh, different associates that he has over there. And the extensive, very extensive correspondence of Mohammed Salim Sderawi a trader and banker based out of Bombay in the early 20th century, for whom we have 15,000 letters alone. Uh, all of these intersect with the travels of a Filichawi, highlight different aspects of this world of circulation and exchange. Having read many of these letters by now, I can say with some confidence uh, that there's a genre here, uh, and one with very clear conventions, if not formulas. At the top of the letter, we get uh, and we get exchanges of greetings that establish reciprocity between the sender and recipient. There's invariably a reference to past letters sent and received between them, which serves to anchor the current letter in a longer correspondence and a longer relationship between the two. Following that, they discuss cargoes they sent and they received, what accounts it should be added to or subtracted from, uh, and here, too, they might mention to one another discrepancies in accounting. Sometimes they'll say, you charged us. I see in the accounts that you sent us that you charged us for 200 bags when, in fact, it was only 150. Um, and finally, before signing off, they give a sense of market conditions. Oftentimes, what they'll do is they'll list, they'll list the prices for different commodities. And what they do is they give a range for it, right? So you have uh, rice between 15 and 16 rupees a bag, right? Um, they give prices for commodities they do business in, they give prices for dates, goods that they import into India, dates, different varieties of dates that they're importing and what the prices are for them, and then different goods that they're exporting from India, flour, rice, coffee, even currencies. They'll give prices for different currencies, how much a currency costs. And they usually, like I said, indicate the price range and at times, they offer commentary on the market, whether the market is favorable, whether it's shrinking, other relevant market information. If it seems formulaic, it's because it is formulaic. 
Once you've learned to read like 10 of these letters, you've learned to read 10,000 of them. Um, letters were not meant to convey affective ties, emotional ties that people had with one another. They were about communicating information to one another and coordinating action. It's through the circulation of these letters and market information that Gulf, merchant, Gulf merchants formed the bonds of the commercial associations that they entered into with one another. As we read the letters, we get a sense of the relationships of commission agency, of partnership, and the other institutional forms that Gulf business in the Indian Ocean took. I'll be happy to answer much more about that in Q&A if you're interested. They also sent one another accounts. Uh, they sent one another money transfers, telegraphs, all sorts of things that they make reference to in the letters, but for, for the most part have not survived. For the most part have not survived. Some collections do preserve some of these. It was through regular correspondence like this that Gulf merchants produced and reproduced commercial society, a transregional commercial society in the Indian Ocean. And adhering to the structure and conventions of letter writing uh, allowed them to communicate their cultural capital with one another, signals inclusion in what we might think of as a epistolary community of agents and partners, epistolary as a referencing letter writing. Okay, so far, I've mostly been describing the world of merchants, and I promised you that it was going to be about a voyage, and then I told you that it wasn't going to be about a voyage at all. But what about our Nochida? What about the Felichawi, whom we started with? How does he fit into the picture? Where does he lie in this world of circulating letters, circulating forms? Let's go back to that notebook, shall we? And here's where things get a little bit more uh, maybe analytical, a bit more abstract. When I first opened up the notebook, the first thing that leaped out at me were contracts inscribed, inscribed in the inside cover of the first book I opened. There's a note at the top, as I said, the colophon, in which uh, he uh, states his name, his descent, his family origin. He also says the book entered into his possession in 1924. That's why I chose 1924 as the date I'm writing about, the date we're talking about. There are also two inscribed contracts for debts taken by different individuals, different individuals with varying combinations of the names Hassan, Ali, Muhammad, and Ahmed. All were entered into in uh, 1341 Hijri and 1924, the same year that he came to own the logbook. This detail will matter, I promise. I was struck by these contracts in part because I just published a whole book on contracts, uh, debt contracts just like these. But also, I was struck by them because I found it so jarring that they would end up in what I had thought was a logbook. Right? They immediately immediately ask myself the question of why? Why would anybody include this information in a logbook? And then I quickly realized that these were not the only contracts. Inside the logbook were lots of other contracts covering all sorts of different situations. There were acknowledgments of debt linked specifically to particular commodities, rice. There were several contracts for loading and freighting dates which again was the principal cargo that al Chawi and his crew would be carrying. And there were what we might call money orders, uh, requests from one person to transfer money to another in a different city. What struck me about these documents is how much they mapped onto a world of documents out there in the marketplace, punctuating virtually every moment in the movement of the Dao from the Gulf and around the Western Indian Ocean were different financial and legal instruments or contracts, notes, orders, receipts, accounts in Arabic, Persian, Gujarati, and English, often two or three of these at once. The veritable cornucopia of instruments, all of which we might think of as forming the documentary infrastructure of the marketplace of the Western Indian Ocean. We see these scattered across different private archives and sometimes even museums around the Gulf. These are what we might think of as transactional ephemera. When we read them on their own, disconnected from one another, they, they're actually really difficult to make sense of. What, what are they doing? But when we connect them together, when we read them all together, we can give this marketplace, this Indian Ocean marketplace, a lot more texture, right? We get a sense of the bonds and the contracts, the agreements, the obligations. And this is how we ought to read these as instruments that circulated between merchants that moved alongside letters, that moved alongside telegraphs and other materials. These are materials of the Indian Ocean Bazaar, of the Indian Ocean Marketplace. Thus, it's unsurprising that Ilfei Lichawi would include some of these. But 
Although the contract in, described in Tufel Chawi's logbook point to a broader world of contracting, they're not actual contracts. I want to draw your attention to the dates again. There are just too many different contracts that take place on the same date, right? And then there are some dates that are too broad to have any legal significance whatsoever. 1341, 1924. I mean, unless 1924 was like an unusually active year for this merchant or this Nogida, which it's not actually, it's a totally normal year. Um, We'd, we'd have to be able to think differently about what, are these, what these are. And the real kicker is that there's one contract on here that really just gives it away. Uh, contract on the bottom right, in which there are actually no names. Let me zoom in for you for a second. The contracting parties are referred to as Fulan bin Fulan. Literally, so-and-so, son of so-and-so. So we have various degrees of abstraction and anonymization here, right? These contracts trace the movement from the specific to the generic. Reading al Felichawi's different contractual templates together, we might think of these as model contracts, right? We can sense, we can get a sense of the different legal forms that punctuated the itinerary of the Tao, the matrices of rights and obligations, the multiple temporalities, the very genres that shape the movement of people and goods and money. But more than that, thinking through these generic contracts forces us to come to terms with the process of thinking and learning about these forms by stripping them of the elements that gave them legal force, but retaining the formulas that give them shape. Al Felichawi opened up the possibility of reanimating these documents whenever he needed them. Right? This is not static legal knowledge. It moves from one person to another and around the shores of the Western Indian Ocean on the deck of the Tao. Remember, this is a book that al Felichawi is carrying with him from one place to another. So the book that, this is the same log book that actually includes the logs of the voyage, right? This is legal thinking in motion, moving from the world of contracts to the page of the notebook and back out again. And this isn't the only place where we see this sort of active thinking. Alongside his notes on contracting were, I mean, these were really exciting, I have to say. I mean, as excited as I got about contracting, I really got excited about these. I mean, how cool is this, right? How cool is this, right? Notes on navigation. In fact, there are far more of these, far more notes on navigation than there are on contracting. He lays out different principles of navigation, different, different tips for navigation, what he calls fawaid, right? different principles, and inscribes different data points, uh, different coordinates for different points, different um, calculations for different, uh, for different stars. Some of, these, some of these actively reference other authors, uh, like the famous 15th century navigator, Ahmed bin Majid, whose name is actually right there. Sheikh Al-Qaeda, okay, Ahmed, Anyway, you can, I can't really read it from there. But Ahmed bin Mayyid, who authored, uh, of course, the Kitab al-Fawayid, and long thought to be the navigator who helped Vasco da Gama cross from uh, the east coast of Africa to India, uh, though that theory has long been debunked. Rather than think of these as like functional notes on navigation, we might do better to understand the conceptual and textual universe within which this kind of movement takes place. Through his notes, we see al felichawis engagement with a literary tradition. Hmm. Over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, Nawakhida from around the Gulf produced writing on various aspects of navigation in the Indian Ocean world. They produced sailing, sailing manuals and nautical almanacs. They produced manuals on weighing pearls and valuing them, on managing accounts. These were sometimes long treatises and at other times shorter discussions or pamphlets. And they always wrote in mixtures of poetry and prose. For the Nawakhida of the 20th century Gulf, Ibn Majid was still present, of course, but there were others. And the more immediate reference for them was the Kuwaiti Nawakhida, uh, Isa al-Gitami, uh, who wrote the book, Dalil al-Mihtar fi ilmi bahar, The Perplexed Guide to the Knowledge of the Seas, which he published in 1917. Al-Gitami is a fascinating, fascinating individual. He's a Nohida, but also an intellectual. He wrote across these maritime genres. He wrote sailing manuals, he wrote trading manuals, he wrote 
Perling manuals. He even wrote an unpublished history, which nobody, everybody knows he wrote, but nobody's been able to locate it, a history of Oman. But of all of his writings, the Dalil was probably the most famous. For the Nawakhida, the Dalil was a standard reference. And we just see so many references to it from observers. The famous, the famous traveler, the Australian traveler, Alan Villiers, notes having seen it on different Daos. Different people say it all the time. They point to, they discuss Ais al-Gitami's manual. Everybody has Ais al-Gitami's manual. It's a standard reference, and it's a manual um, that al-Gitami imagined people would actually use. He says time and time again in his different writings that he wrote these to be used, and he wrote them specifically for use by his fellow sailors, whom he called our Arab brothers, Ahl uh, al people of the ships. He writes, he says, al-Gitami himself says, he writes in a nautical dialect that his readers would be able to understand. He doesn't write in the classical Arabic tradition, and he actually comments on this, and he says, I know that the, the grammarians and those who uphold fine prose will probably uh, cast aspersions on my abilities as a writer, but I'm not writing for them. I'm writing for our Arab brothers, the people of the ships. The dialect that he and others wrote and constituted a distinctly nautical vernacular, we might say, that set itself off against a classical tradition, yet lived and breathed on the high seas. What I'm gesturing to uh, here, and I talk about much more in the book, obviously, is a history of ideas coming out of this sea of texts that move alongside the Tao. We might think of these as texts that Nawakhida carry with them. Rather than think of these as individual publications, we might think of them as forming a corpus of writing in the sea and on the sea, texts that are in conversation with one another. And they are in conversation with one another. Ma'adin al-Asafi, Ilm al-Bahar, is actually a direct response to Isa al-Gitami's uh, al Al-Felichawi, we know, actively read these texts. He read Ibn Majid, but he also read Al-Gitami. He copies these notes from them. He consumes them. He copies principles from them. He copies data from them. There are moments when we look through his notes, and you see that the, the phrases are lifted verbatim from Isa Al-Gitami's manual. Right? He consumes them, copies them, renders that knowledge portable. Rather than carrying al gatami's manual with him, he copies down what he thinks uh, is important. Actually, it's much more complicated than that. It's clearly somebody else who's doing this writing, and I'd be happy to talk more about that in Q&A. But in a sense, these are part of the itinerary. These ideas form part of the infrastructure of circulation in the oceanic world. They don't exist in the abstract ether of intellectual history either. They're actively engaged with and inscribed into the journey by everyday thinkers, everyday readers and thinkers like al Felichawi. We might read them together with the contract to think of the ways in which knowledge itself circulated between different Tao captains and across generations. And again, it's not al Felichawi who is writing these down. It's actually, I'll give it away, it's his master, okay? It's the person who, it's the person who teaches him, it's his teacher who writes it. And we know that because we have his teacher's notebooks as well. Um, through a combination of manuals, models, and practice, we see navigational thinking and commercial practice move around the Indian Ocean world. Both of these point to shared conventions, but also a shared history of ideas that are generated on board the Tao and around the marketplaces of the Indian Ocean world. But of course, it goes beyond the deck of the Tao onto other ships as well. By the time of Ilfei Lechawi's voyages, the British Empire had already reconfigured much of the political and economic geography of the Western Indian Ocean. The mobilities that uh, someone like Ilfei Lechawi engaged in, the routes he traversed, were in a sense rerouted or channeled through new nodes of imperial power. But it wasn't just a question of politics and power. Empire was also all over the writing that we find on board the Tao. Rather than suggest some sort of sealed off, self-referencing world of the vernacular that Nochida has consumed, I want to suggest that Nochida writings were already entangled in various forms of imperial knowledge production. Over the 19th and 20th century, British officials, British officials attempted to craft a trans-oceanic imperial surveillance regime designed to track the maritime flows of goods and people, in the name of combating piracy, slave trafficking, and smuggling, of course, we have the expert on that in this room as well. Shout out to Johan. <laughs> the Nochidas, for Nochidas navigating this world of empire, 
meant engaging with graphic artifacts like customs records and manifests, permits, quarantine documents, receipts, other manifestations of an imperial bureaucracy like the safe conduct passes that we saw earlier. We've, many of these make their way into the Malabar chest. But let me talk about two immediately salient ones, some ways a little less obvious ones. One is a bit more obvious maybe, but we'll start with the less obvious one. When captains like Afei Chawi lost sight of land, they had to calculate their position based on measurements they took of the sun at noon. In these moments, the logbook entries look a little different. They're longer, and they record measurements taken. And after listing a series of such measurements, captains like Afei Chawi would invariably state that they entered it into the Nuri. It was only after a lot of asking around that I came to learn that this was a reference to Nori's nautical tables, which they used to calculate the readings error, that is to correct their readings of the declination and angle of the sun, which is critical to wayfinding. A copy of the Nori, of course, was also in Efei Chawi's chest. What's interesting to me about this is how they incorporate this nautical almanac uh, into their daily uh, repertoire. This was a text designed to facilitate navigation by British seamen in the service of an expanding British empire. And yet these captains are able to seize onto it and incorporate it into their daily navigational practices on board the Dao. Immediately, this destabilizes our notion that there was an Arabic tradition of navigation that's somehow separate from a European one. Right? It suggests that there is at least a degree of entanglement between these different traditions the temporal horizons of the Tao and those of the empire bleed into one another in ways that are maybe a bit more subtle than we might have previously thought. But of course, the Nuri is just one part of this entanglement. Actually, the very first thing I saw in the Fei Chawi's chest, the very thing, first thing you saw after the, the, the notebook, of course, were the maps. Remember the maps? We're about to see a couple of maps right now. I hadn't actually seen maps uh, by Nawakhada before. I hadn't seen the maps that Nawakhada had used, uh, and I was really excited. But then, uh, as we slowly unfurled them, um, I became less excited and a bit more confused. Um, these were not maps, the kinds of maps that I imagined. These were British admiralty charts, and British admiralty charts that were annotated in the Nawakhada's hand. You see his translation of different ports, and then his drawing of that, the lighthouse uh, over there. In purchasing these maps, this is what I'm trying to set you here, in purchasing these maps, annotating them, circulating them around the Noach of the community, and we see notes, uh, notes about whom the Nochida purchased the maps from, where he purchased them from, when. Nochida actively domesticated the tools of imperial expansion, tools like admiralty charts, weaving them into their own systems of knowledge. In a sense, they're no different from the Gulf merchants of India who have been drawing imperial technologies and laws into their business repertoires for decades. Nazil Felishawi navigated the crooked around the Arabian Sea who drew on all of these, the maps, the Dalil, the contracts, Nori's nautical tables, and much, much more all at once. The act of sailing, of navigating, didn't involve just doing. It involved a lot of thinking as well. As he moved around the Indian Ocean, from Kuwait to India and back again, he read, he wrote, he calculated, and he mobilized different graphic artifacts. And then he tucked them all away into a Malabar tea chest. Over the last, hmm, maybe almost hour, I've been showing you lots of the materials I found in Felichawi's chest and other trunks like it. When I first saw these materials, I was struck by how rich they were, how much they told me about a person and a life I didn't know at all. I was also struck by how little they had to tell us about the place where I found them, Kuwait. As rich as the material is, none of it suggests itself as a candidate for a national history. Although we see these kinds of artifacts all over the country, they are seldom told as part of the nation. These are materials that have been pushed to the margins and a narrative of a national formation anchored in dry land. Actually, there's no real place for them in a national narrative. Though they involve known individuals, known families, they also involve communities, places, people, and processes 
that fall well outside of the territorial nation state. But in many ways, it might just be a matter of perspective. Read as artifacts of an Indian Ocean history, these are actually quite central. Part of the appeal that Indian Ocean history has for me as somebody invested in the history of the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula is that it breaks down the boundaries of these geographical containers, allows us the freedom to roam, sometimes to nearby places, sometimes to places that are a little bit more distant. But it's more than just new geographies that emerge when we think oceanically. With those come new processes and temporalities from which to consider the histories of the Gulf. Actually, as we think of it as a part of an Indian Ocean history, we are able to better embed the Gulf in processes of world history more generally. Transregional trade, empire, industrialization, international law, capitalism, global intellectual history, to name just a few that reflect my own interests. Rather than think of the Gulf as some sort of weak appendage to the Middle East that centered that on the Ottoman Empire and post-Ottoman societies, we can begin to see the Gulf and Arabian Peninsula as forming a central part of an exciting conversation on Indian Ocean history. And it's more than just a scholarly move. I'd argue that without an oceanic history, we're unable to make sense of most of the Gulf's pre-oil past. And it's not as though we don't care about the maritime history of the Gulf. We celebrate it in all sorts of different ways, different festivals, different artifacts and museums. Actually, you all know probably that the Dao is an icon for many different countries in the Gulf. It appears on currencies, on national emblems, and much more, celebrated year after year after year after year. But I'd argue actually that without an Indian Ocean history against which we might read them, uh, Dao's are empty signifiers. Without an Indian Ocean history, we're unable to understand the world that produced the Tao, produced all of the writing on board the Tao, produced the communities that formed around the Tao. Without an Indian Ocean history, we only see the object in front of us. And in some ways, we become, we become tourists to our own past. Right? We just consume without understanding. What I've presented you with today is an experiment in, in oceanic microhistory microhistory on an Indian Ocean scale. I'd be happy to answer questions about what I mean about that, but the most facile answer is that by grounding ourselves in something small, a single person, an event, or in this case, a voyage, or even a notebook, we might be able to talk about much larger processes. Through Othele Chawi's travels and writings, through the voyage of al Awai, the crooked, we open up a vista onto at least some of the processes that conjured up a transregional world one that's dispersed across coastal Arabia, India, and East Africa. If these are scattered histories, it's by moving with the Tao that we can gather what's been scattered. I've given you one slice, one thread, one voyage through this world. There are hundreds more that I could have followed, thousands more arrows pointing both ways between the Gulf and Indian Ocean. I've chosen to tell you about an ordinary voyage by an ordinary nohada all to cast light on much broader processes and ask bigger questions. By writing a Middle Eastern, by writing a history of the Middle East, you might say, that decenters places like Istanbul, Cairo, Damascus, and Beirut, and adds other nodes, Basra, Bombay, Masqat, Aden, Zanzibar, we allow for the possibility of new spaces. But more than that, we allow for the possibility of new narratives and new notions of where the histories of the Gulf might lie. Thank you all. I appreciate the time.